Coming up today on Locked On Texas Tech, been a lot of talking about utilizing tight ends in the Red Raider offense, but has the time for walking arrived just yet? Why we believe it or don't? Next on Locked On Texas Tech. You are Locked On Texas Tech, your daily podcast on the Texas Tech Red Raiders. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Great to be with you again on Locked On Texas Tech on the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day, always free and available on YouTube or anywhere you get podcasts. And thanks as always for making us your first listen. Today's episode brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more. And right now throughout the summer, I'm talking all summer long, FanDuel's hooking up all customers with a boost or a bonus daily. That's right. There's something for everyone every day all summer long so visit fanduel.com to get started with the only chris level i'm casey cowan chris great to be back with you and as we are getting nearer to fall camp nearer to red raider football you and i are going to dive into some conversations on both sides of the ball across all position groups as we've got some different angles and questions and takes on these various groups and one of them we're going to dive into here today is one that I think a lot of folks are paying close attention to, and that is the tight ends. And offensively, we have seen, of course, over the years, uh, some tight end play used against Texas Tech in the Big 12 Conference. There have been some great ones come through this league here or there, and there have been a couple in red and black that we've enjoyed seeing as well. But I don't know about you, I really feel like within sort of a more recent era, there has been conversation about wanting to see the tight ends utilized more often and wanting to see them featured more often. There have been some impressive guys measurable-wise that you've had as far as some options, whether it's Mason Tharp or Baylor Cup. But I don't think, at least in my opinion, we have really see it come to fruition yet like I would hope. And I'm wondering today, is there a reason as we get closer to this camp or this season to believe that this could be the year? We'll get into some of these names, obviously, that are a part of this group heading into this season and talk about some of the tight end hierarchy. But I know that you've got memories just like I do of guys like Chase Kaufman or Agnew or Gresham or so many others that have come through the league, man, and just punished Texas Tech. And then, like I said, from a red and black perspective, one of the best in the history of the program uh, in Jay Samaro and a way back shout out to my guy, Bristol Olamua. Once upon a time, <laughs> once upon a time as well, man. The tight end can be a killer when you've got it to utilize, but utilizing it has proved a little bit challenging, I feel like, for the Red Raiders, at least on a consistent basis. Yeah, when you want to win, throw it to the tight end, right? Remember, that was our uh, – and, and and they did uh, at the end of the game at Iowa State. That was uh, Baylor Cup's probably biggest – Remember the there was a time whenever every road game that you had won in the Joey McGuire era, uh, there was a time when when uh, he he was the the one the Baylor Cup was the one catching the, a touchdown pass in each of those games. Yeah, uh, I think uh, I, you know, and I I think last year you really felt like you had a, a duo, and yet I think early on Baylor got hurt with a shoulder injury. And it wasn't severe enough to keep him out. However, it was harnessed. It limited him. It required surgery. And so, but he he was able to play in every game. And then, you know, Mason missed, what, what do we want to say, five or six games, maybe seven games to where, you know, he got, I think he, he after that West Virginia game, and then there was this, this, the meat of the middle of the season, you were without him. And it was basically Baylor Cup and Jaden York, and that was pretty much it. Yes, you had Henry Teeter and Charles Robinson and some different – Charlie Robinson and, and some different guys that, you know, were fullbacks or, or whatever. But last year it was just – it was a case of we, we, we never got to see what we had hoped for because we – they're just – Health-wise, it just wasn't there. And Mason ends up with, eight, I think, eight, a total of 18 catches. And we saw flashes. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's kind of what Bristol Olamu was back in, like, I think, 2004. You know, that, that that's where it was a giant tease. It's like, you know. <laughs> and, and, and even Jace, as good as he was, he was not 
utilize like you're trying to utilize guys now. He was more That's of a, a big wideout. Uh, and and I, you know, the Mackey Award folks frustrated everybody when they're like, we're not even going to, you know, he's not even up for our award because we, we think he's a big receiver. Like, I was going to say, what are you working for the Mackey Award? A big yeah, wideout. We're still yeah. fighting that propaganda <laughs> yeah, fight. Yeah, like, screw you, Mackey Award people. Right. He put his hand down enough. Right. Uh, you know, in the ground enough, but, but, you know, but they did flex him out quite a bit. And I think yeah. that, I mean, just like you're doing, you, you did that with Mason and some of those guys last year, but it, it was kind of a, what could have been, or what we'd hoped it would be kind of scenario last year. That's what makes this year's group a bit different because there is so many more possibilities and it's not, you know, reliant upon just one or two guys. And that's what's fun to kind of look at the at the group and its totality and and kind of figure out okay, we because you've got you've got the right now you've got the incumbents and, and the guys that could push through and then you've got the guys that their time is not not now and yet that's okay and you've got you've you've given somebody like Trey Jackson time to be able to grow up. Well, you see it on the screen there, talking to walking time, and uh, I hope <laughs> I hope that we're getting to walking, but. I, I just wonder, am I off on the talking part? Uh, from a Kitley or McGuire perspective, they do want to utilize, don't they? I feel like there has been conversation about, and of course, seeing who they pursue uh, from a transfer standpoint, I, I feel like there's a desire there. Maybe I'm making more out of it because well, I was a tight end once upon a time, and I wanted to always be thrown to the tight end. But uh, I, I feel like there has been some talking like, hey, we want to use these guys, and uh, we want to give them opportunity. Some of why that hasn't happened so far, as you're alluding to there, has been kind of out of their control, obviously, from an injury standpoint. But from Coach Kittley and Coach McGuire's perspective, there is a desire, right? I'm not just dreaming that up, am I? Which is why you go – I mean, let, let's think about if, if uh, how much they've added to this position in the offseason. Yeah. They went and added Jalen Conyers. They went and, and, and actually had a different tight end committed – and then still went out and got John Carlos Miller, and it caused one of the tight ends that was committed to go. Yeah, I, I, I'm out, you know. Um, and they didn't care because I think they ultimately got who they wanted. Then they added Jason Llewellyn as a walk on, and you add that with the signing and Trey Jackson and then uh, Mason Tharp. And so you, you've, you've sure it clearly matters. And, and look, look at what they've done from a personnel standpoint. I think. I think part of the problem in the last couple of years, there's a direct correlation into your offensive line struggling and your tight ends not catching as many passes as you would want. Because I think that Josh Cochran would go out of his way to say, don't judge these guys solely based on how many catches they get in the game. They are playing and playing very, very well for us right now. Yeah, they're just doing different things, but don't just follow the ball when you're trying to assess what these guys can or can't do. And I think when you're keeping guys in the block to help out what has been an average offensive line, that's part of the rub there. You can't have it all. Uh, and and then you've got a quarterback that's not as that's dinged up at, at, at times and not as mobile as you want, but you know, whatever. And so anyway, there's just a lot, I think, that factors into that now. You've got some depth there. Hopefully, you've upgraded the offensive line. I, I, there is no doubt that they would want to run a lot of 11 and 12 and even 13 personnel groups out there because they've got the pieces that, to be able to do it. And it stresses out a defense when you can run it uh, and, and do some things. But the, the tight end group deserves a lot of credit for Taj Brooks's year. So while you may have not seen a lot of those catches and yards, targets go to those tight ends, Taj Brooks – got to eat, you know, uh, he got to eat quite a bit because of the, some of the big boy work those guys were doing with their hand on the ground and, and the blocking. Well, and I know that a, a valuable running back from a play action standpoint, obviously can mean a lot of thing for a lot of things for a wide receiver down the field. But one of the things that I really think about as far as that bread and butter is not even necessarily so much down the field, but kind of down the seam and, and some of that play action with your tight end. I think a lot about tight ends in the red zone, uh, obviously, and wanting those guys that are six nine, six five, six six, six seven, whatever it might be, uh, to really factor in in a big way there. But uh, it's really exciting to think about what you could be from a physicality standpoint uh, if you're throwing that many guys at it. I mean, some of the personnel groupings you're talking about there with one, two, or three maybe 
on the field at the same time in tandem with Taj Brooks is really exciting. Just think about kind of the identity that could give you as far as the physicality. And obviously, a wide receiver has got to have great chemistry uh, with the quarterback as well. But I think there's a different sort of kind of chemistry sometimes with a tight end and a quarterback. And maybe it's just because of the portion of the field that they roam or something like that, that it oft- it oftentimes gets described as kind of a security blanket whenever you've got great chemistry with the quarterback and a tight end or multiple tight ends. And obviously with the quarterback situation being in flux and sometimes you're looking back and it's a different face there from week to week or from practice to game day, I can only imagine that that has set back that kind of effort. But does that make sense that I, how I describe it as a different kind of chemistry? I don't, there are security blankets for a QB, I guess, in a lot of different varieties, but I often feel like we hear a tight end really kind of fit that bill. First, today's episode brought to you by FanDuel, America's number one sports book. And summertime means baseball, burgers, and money in the bank when you get to picking winners with FanDuel. And right now, new customers get $200 in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. That's right, $200 you can use to cool off and beat the heat with a refreshing parlay. Ah. Uh. An over-under play or by getting the money line mojo going. So visit fanduel.com slash locked on and make a splash by adding a big win to your summer bucket list with FanDuel, America's number one sports book. There are security blankets for a QB, I guess, in a lot of different varieties, but I often feel like we hear a tight end really kind of fit that bill. Well, you're you're talking Mahomes and Kelsey. I mean, that, that'd be fine. Yeah. That'd be all right. <laughs> and, and that's that's like a, other otherworldly chemistry. <laughs> right. We're like, okay, I don't know how they're they're doing this, but typically the the tight end is in close proximity to the quarterback. You're you're underneath. You're not on a a, a deeper route. Yeah, there, yeah. There's, some, there's some block and release type stuff, and yes. you can really get somebody in in whether it's short yardage or goal line or whatever. And I think that's. Uh, there's absolutely needs to be uh, some, some chemistry. What 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 your group is this year, though, compared to last, if, if you want to compare the two, you know, meeting rooms or, or, or position groups or whatever last year to this year, you're a lot more not not only deeper, okay, uh, based on just just available bodies, but you're a lot more athletic. And what do I mean by that? Because it's not a slight on Baylor Cup or Jaden York at all. They, they were plenty athletic, but this is a bit different. You didn't have anybody last year in that position group that could run the Wildcat. You know, like, and, and, and yeah. like, where, where a team was like, hey, just snap it to him and let him go. I mean, that's, that's 6'4, 265 of Jalen Conyers <laughs> in, in Tempe, Arizona, you, you know running the zone read and just running QB power and all that stuff. That's a big, big boy. You also have what I will term a big wide out, kind of an a Jace Amaro type body type in John Carlos Miller. That is a down the field guy. That's not at all what Baylor or, or Mason were last year. That's just not their skill set. They're more of a contested catch guy, catch radius, throw it up to us. Uh, yeah, we you, we may get you on a, on a busted coverage or whatever, but John Carlos Miller is is a legit, you know, explosive big wideout down the field, and he's got some some quick twitch to him. You just didn't have those components to this particular position group. Now, it's worth mentioning: is this particular group is going to be as good helping Taj or helping the offensive line or helping keep Baron upright? Remains to be seen. Because I think you maybe give up a little bit to get some of the the playmaking down the field, so we'll mm-hmm. see kind of, you know, what what that what that ultimately looks like. I'm wondering if you know, from the standpoint of trying to identify kind of a, a hierarchy, if it's even sort of possible. I, I asked the question there on the screen on the rundown: Who's the odd man out? Because when we're talking about depth, I mean, there's only so many passes to go around within a game, and obviously, as you've already described, it's not just as pass catchers. Uh, as it relates to what what a tight end is asked to do. Um, and I'm kind of thinking now, I'm hearing you talk about it, maybe it's uh, maybe I'm looking at the hierarchy or a depth chart or a priority list, whatever way you want to describe it, in the wrong kind of way because of the different kind of skill sets 
that these these guys sort of offer. So they're not just like all prototypical tight end one, two, and three. There's a little variety, I guess, between the guys. But I wonder, do we sort of start the the hierarchy conversation from a classification standpoint? Do we talk about a Tharp and a Conyers first and then go to a Miller and then a Llewellyn and a Trey Jackson? Is it more so from a, like you said, uh, skill set measurables? This guy can stretch a little more. This guy maybe is a little heavier uh, standpoint. How, how do we even kind of begin that conversation as to uh, trying to figure out how they're going to divvy this stuff up? Because it's great to have this collection, but it's a heck of a puzzle probably to also try to figure out how to actually utilize them. Yeah, this is far from a headache for somebody like Zach Kitley and Josh, Josh Cochran. That they, they they love this problem. <laughs> this is this is the this is a fun fun problem to have here. Um, odd man out. I, I'll, I'll attack the the this, the the conversation this way. You, you've got enough pieces that should allow Trey Jackson to redshirt. So if you want to say mm-hmm. he's odd man, and he's a freshman. Uh, and he, he enrolled early and all that, and he needs to gain a lot of weight and all that stuff. And I think that it, so he, he'll be allowed to do what he needs to do anyway and, and come along a bit, you know, so you don't have to throw him out there at 220 pounds when he's and ask him to do things that he's just not ready to do yet from a, a body type standpoint. Yeah. I would say that the four above him, it's, it's very situational, but you know, Jason Llewellyn would be like the, TE4, if you want to go that route. Okay, but yeah. but but even then, he caught a, a short yardage touchdown pass in the in the spring game. I think in situations he will be uh you know duck duck goose, like okay, you're it. And like, you know, you I mean it's just like how they used Henry Teeter last year on several red zone and you, you try to get him sleeping and focused on other things, and then here comes Henry Teeter, and it's like he's just standing wide open in the end zone. That, that's how I view Jason Llewellyn very situ- Jason Llewellyn very situational. Like, is but there an H back type component to that sort of also? I guess po- possibly. Pull I think back, that's what's kind of fun to see, kind of how how that would would go. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I don't think you you want like John Carlos Miller with his hand on the ground in short yardage, just grinding away and like, let's, let's run Taj behind him. He's 250, you know, and, and that's not what he's going to be best at. I think he's capable, but you see what I'm saying? So it's, it's more situational, whereas you want to get him out in the open field and let him turn that bad boy loose and get 30 yards down the field where he also caught a touchdown pass in the, you know, in the, in the spring game. But I, I remember somebody in the spring saying this to me about Mason Tharp. They're like, it's like it's like everything else, man. You 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 get everybody gets caught up in the new fancy shiny toys, yeah. and you forget about the guy that's been here. And if he's healthy, that's really where the bread will be buttered. And I don't disagree with that sentiment at all. It's the guys that you've you've that have put the time in, that are just waiting to blossom if they get lucky enough to stay healthy and available and all those things. Because we've seen whenever he is healthy and available. He is a game changer. We just haven't seen enough availability. Uh, hence the reason that you you need these other guys coming in because of the injury issues and, and things like that with, with Mason. But if, if given the opportunity to play 11 or 12 games, you will really like what you get stat, statistically and, and otherwise. Uh, he is an anno- – I mean, this is an NFL-type guy if, if the, his body will cooperate. I mean, they just don't make a lot of people that are like 6'9", 270 that can move like he does. That is a phenomenal human. Uh, I cannot emphasize to you how the kind of person – and and I, I love that about Conyers because he came home. He wants to be here. Like this is, this is where I wanted to be really all along. So that part is fun. And then the John Carlos Miller part is fun because he's like the – he's different – and he's got more years of eligibility. And, you know, the current commitment that was here was like, yeah, man, I'm out. Don't forget about Miller. He's the Ohio State connection. Remember right. when the Ohio State folks are going, dude, don't don't sit in the class yet, young man. Don't look, just hold, call. We got some timeouts. Let's use them. Just hold tight. He's <laughs> like, man, I'm, I'm happy where I'm at. That's a heck of a compliment. And that's where you're at with this particular group. But Llewellyn is a bit of a, 
you know, he, he was a very highly touted recruit. It yeah. just went to Oklahoma and it just didn't, it didn't really jive. He still got some years, plural of eligibility, but out of high school, man, there weren't many that, that, uh, that were ranked higher than he was out of Alito. Um, I mean, Tharp is, is the physical specimen of the group. Yes. If you can get him to stay on the field. And I like the way that you described that. It's the way I described it to myself. Uh, as a seventh grader, if I can just get my body to cooperate, I'll be an NFL guy, as in <laughs> grow more and become faster. That didn't work out, but he's got it. Six foot nine, 275 ish is what Tharp goes. If we can keep him on the field, obviously. Um, and you're looking at some other guys. You've already mentioned some of the measurables for somebody like Conyers and thinking, man, that's a load. But but Tharp is at the top of that list from a, uh, a measurables standpoint. Um, I guess I kind of wonder maybe which one. Well, before I ask this question, back to Llewellyn for a second. I, I've learned in this era not to discount anyone's opportunity just because of a, a walk-on status or something like that, because that takes on a totally different definition <laughs> than it used to once upon a time. And it sounds like he's firmly in the group, at least as far as uh, maybe not one or two, but he's in the group. Uh, to be a guy to get some opportunity, right? And maybe if it goes well or the time is bided in a productive fashion, we'll see him in a different category. But that walk-on aspect, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, I, I thought he was in that category. That walk-on aspect is absolutely not necessarily providing the context, I guess, that it did once upon a time, right? And, and, it's, and, it, and his status says that could be just temporary. Yeah. You know, that's the way that that – I mean, that's what the player uh, – and several of them are, are like that. Cam Brown, and we talked about it in a recent show, he'd be the same way. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm this initially, but my plan is to not be this yeah. for too much longer. Uh, you know, I, I'd like to be placed on scholarship and all those things. But, uh, but yeah, you know, Jason Llewellyn was uh, – I mean, he was a four-star prospect, according to most recruiting services, out of Alito. And I think you initially wanted him – out of high school, lost him to Oklahoma. And, and it, like I said, but he, he will, he's a situational guy and he's somebody that if they're one of the guys above him is dinged up or can't, I mean, you just, everybody moves up a spot and then, right. and, and depending on what we need, but these are all guys that you'll see on special teams. And, and then it allows what we've talked in recent weeks too, about these days, maybe more so than before, Winning in, in in this era is all about versatility. This really allows you to be extremely versatile with what you want to do when you've got this many pieces. You know, because this this helps you smash mouth people. This helps you really if if you don't like if if, if a team has really good corners but bad linebackers, let's let's get get into some tight end heavy game planning this week. You can really like you know kind of. Play, play chess a bit with week to week on when you've got all these options available to you, but health and productivity certainly comes along with that. But just, it just allows for so many more options. We would hope that we get what we, you know, and, and I don't know if you're looking at anybody majoring in, in a ton of catches here in this group, the, the group probably needs to be judged in, in its entirety uh, when we look mm -hmm. back on the, you know, because I don't know if you're looking at, but it, you know, it, it, whether it's Jalen or Mason or or John Carlos of catching thirty to forty passes, I mean, but yeah. but I think you would add them add them up and and look at the group, and then also don't forget if if Taj is running well, though these boys have a lot to say about that too. That that's absolutely correct. Uh, before we get out of here, just wanted to ask you a question. Um, I don't think Mason Tharp can be the answer because we've seen him and we kind of we know what he is. But I'm just wondering which one individually, if you had to isolate one, really intrigues you the most as far as being excited to see what they are. Because I thought it was going to be pretty easy to say Jalen Conyers, uh, and it may still be. But as you get into camp and the coaches start talking so much about Miller, and then he makes arguably the most electric play of the spring there in that de facto spring game, he's creeping pretty high on the list as well. So I really just wonder if there's one you could pick and you're like, man, I'm ready to see what this dude actually is going to be week to week. Uh, what's the name that, that pops into your mind? But as you get into camp and the coaches start talking so much about Miller and then he makes 
arguably the most electric play of the spring there in that de facto spring game. He's creeping pretty high on the list as well. So I really just wonder if there's one you could pick and you're like, man, I'm ready to see what this dude actually is going to be week to week. Uh, what's the name that, that pops into your mind? It's him because he's the best athlete in this, in this room. Uh, I think he's got the most upside. He may not be the most complete tight end. He may not be the best blocker. Uh, this may not be even somebody you, you necessarily want to count on in short yardage, but I just think he's got, he, he's just kind of figuring it out. And I think that if he can get in the open field, he, he's a mismatch nightmare, you know, and I yeah. think that you just need to, you know, see what you've got and see how it works and fits into everything else. But no, he's the answer to that question for me anyway, just because I think he's the best athlete. And I think the Ohio State example is one. I think people all unanimously, you know, kind of talked about, dude, he's he's different, like in a good way. Uh, when they got through some of those weeks in the spring, you could just yes. tell, and and I and you you saw that. I mean, some of that commentary, and then he was able to do it, and so now it's just a matter of him being able to do it uh, when the when the lights come on, because he's not at Elon anymore. I mean, this is well, this is a step up. I'm glad you mentioned that the Elon aspect, um, and that's not Musk University; it's a totally different thing. Um, I, you know, with Conyers and Llewellyn, it's both the conversation sort of revolving around. Well, they've been on this level, but they need a fresh start for whatever reason. They they want to change the scenery. So there's a little bit of an asterisk that comes there to wonder, okay, can they really make good on some of the hype, whether it's you know a recruiting accolade back whenever they were high schoolers or just some of the measurables. Uh, but Miller has not been on this level before and is getting that kind of attention. So I think that's probably one of the reasons why I would go for him as far as uh, being most intrigued by him as well. Highlight of the show for me was just, I, I don't get to tickle Chris Level all that often, uh, virtually speaking. Um, and to see your reaction to the name Bristol Olamua was oh, something yeah. I'm not going to forget. <laughs> because he was a bit of a, it, it, it was like this mystery for a bit. He was related to Robert Anai, who was the offensive line coach. Was he really? I didn't know that. Yes. And okay. that's kind of how they you know, knew about him and all those things, but it, it was kind of rumored for a bit and we were kind of like, you know, and then, and then it was just such a tease because he, I don't think football was necessarily his favorite, but the package of yeah. size and skill when, when it was available was just like something we had not ever seen before around <laughs> here. And, uh, I remember in that 04 TCU game when you won 70 to 21, maybe, I think he caught a uh, a tutty or two in that game, and I was like, "This is a whole lot of fun." He's a whole lot of Samoan. He's a whole lot of fun. Just uh, yeah, I mean I'll, the whole the whole thing. I may have uh, mixed up some of the other names I was citing elsewhere in the Big Twelve Conference, but I remember these Missouri guys, Oklahoma guys, oh, yeah. Oklahoma State guys, mm -hmm. uh, Chase Kaufman, Michael Egno, who was a Plainview guy, I think, somehow got out of our backyard. Uh, Pettigrew, Gresham. I mean, the list goes on. David Thomas from Wolfworth to uh, oh, Iowa UT State. Once upon a time, Iowa I mean, State had a bunch of them. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. you know, in, in recent years, Charlie Kolar. Yep. Uh, the, there, there was you know the, that that's the honestly that's the team in the last five to seven years that I'm like when they were really good there for that stretch. Like you just couldn't you couldn't like I want to I want to have the tight end like that, and I want yeah. I want the play caller. <laughs> And the quarterback to be able to, I want, I want, I want to do do that what they're doing because it's like you couldn't stop it. Um, but yeah, that's because uh, they they were like six six seven or six eight, and they just feed these dudes. And you're like it, it, jealousy. I, I was like, where, I, I want to shop at that store. Like, where, where you know? <laughs> well, it can be one of those positions that when they're that good and you can utilize them that effectively, you you have eleven guys out there defensively, but there may not be an answer among those eleven. Uh, to really address that. I mean, it, it's kind of like a cheat code when it's working that well. So hopefully we can approach anything near that and it'll be a good year for Texas Tech offensively if that's the case. Good stuff, Chris. Appreciate the insights and perspectives uh, as always, man. And the time as well. Enjoyed it. And we'll see you for the next one tomorrow. Keep hope alive, everybody. Guns up.
get subscribed on YouTube or anywhere you get podcasts so you never miss an episode. Of course, the best way to help us grow the show is to comment anything below. Thanks for making us your first listen. And for your second listen, of course, check out Locked On Big 12 on YouTube or anywhere you get podcasts as well. For Chris, I'm Casey. Thanks for being out there. And we hope to see you back for the next round on Locked On Texas Tech. <laughs>